Hello everyone. So we are going ahead and not doing the job scientist today. We're just doing another part of Starfish because I'm kind of wanting to get through it at this point. We're only about halfway through. So um, without further ado, we are just going to keep on keeping on with this story. Permanently altered. I think mom's changing when she rips the latest weight loss articles off the fridge. But then I see she's only making room for bariatric surgery success stories. Ugh. I guess it doesn't matter that her sister, my Aunt Zoe, almost died from bariatric surgery. Or that I'm only 11, almost 12. According to most doctors, you need to be at least 14 to have weight loss surgery. But if mom wants me to have it, she'll find a way. I realized that today. With the article she found about a 12-year-old who had it, and oh my gosh, even a 5-year-old, and a 2-year-old? 5 years old, 2. Their bodies cut open and permanently surgically altered just because they're fat. I, oh, there's more, okay. My aunt, despite the risks, decided to have the surgery. Just about everything that could go wrong did. I still remember sitting by her bed, holding her cold hands, and listening to a machine breathe for her. She survived after six weeks in the ICU. How could mom risk putting me through all of that? Well, we've established that mom's abusive. But I, like, oh, I don't like this, and I don't believe for a second that bariatric surgery was performed on a two-year-old or a five-year-old. I find that extremely hard to believe. I gotta, I'm, I'm actually just, I'm gonna look it up. There's not gonna be any visuals for you guys, but I'm curious. Uh, bariatric surgery, two year old. Oh nope, I guess there was. I stand corrected. There was a two year old in Saudi Arabia who weighed seventy two pounds and had a ma body mass index of forty one. And they gave it to him because uh, he suffered from sleep apnea that caused him to stop breathing while asleep. I don't understand that, I'll be honest. Um, but clearly the author, like, dug for that. Goddamn. I don't like the demonization of bariatric surgery. Don't get me wrong. I don't think it should be performed on kids at all, especially two, five two years old, five years old, 12 year old, even 14 years old. Like I, I struggle with the concept of that sort of surgery on children because children, unless there's some exceptional medical issues can bounce back from their weight. And it's, it's all, it, it comes back to the parents. It comes back to the parents. Like, I just, oh, God, it irritates me so goddamn much. Swarmed. Sharks usually attack when a whale is alone or distressed. The sharks at school swarm around me the day I break a desk in math class. First, the desk legs steadily, slowly spread out, like the legs on a cartoon horse, after a fat cowboy settles up for a ride. I struggle to escape, but I'm stuck. With the final creak of the bending metal and crack of wood, the desk and I crumble to the floor. I am a sea turtle on its back, trying to get out of the rubble, trying to get up, trying to will the earth to open up and swallow me whole. The sharks circle, sink their teeth in, taking turns biting with laughter and words. Splash broke a chair! Dude, that was metal! Collapsed like a soda can. Poor desk didn't stand a chance. Metal and wood cut into and jab my stomach, sides, back, and legs. It hurts to breathe. Help me. Somebody. Please. They just keep laughing. Screwed. It's like Moses with the Red Sea as Mr. Harrington parts the crowd. What's going on here? My math teacher sees me, frees me, and stretches his hand toward mine. And none of you were kind enough to help. As if one person could help her up, says someone. As if one fire department could, says another. 
Mr. Harrington makes big circles over his head, like a cowboy winding up a lasso. Detention for all of you. Everyone groans. He examines the desk, says a bad word under his breath. Who took the bolts off the screws? More detention for y all y'all if the person who did it doesn't start talking. Courtney raises her hand. Guilty. Math question. What is the probability of Marissa not being the one to tell Courtney to do it? So, again, more, like, almost cartoonish levels of bullying right in front of teachers. This one stood up for her, so at least there was that. But, God, like, honestly, this girl's whole life, I understand the point is that her being fat makes her a target for everybody, and that's what makes her life miserable and people should accept being fat so that way kids don't have to deal with this but I mean her life is exceptionally terrible in so many ways that it's hard to take any of this really seriously because they lay it because the, the author Lisa Phipps lays this on so fucking thick round of applause my jaws clench so tight I think my teeth will crumble in my mouth like damp chalk Marissa laughs mouths blubber belly I lunge forward. Mr. Harrington steps in front of me. Walk away, Ellie. His voice booms again. Courtney, principal's office. A few people clap as she struts down the aisle and out the door. Best prank ever. No more comments. Mr. Harrington eyes the room. Let's make that two days of detention. Want to make it three? Keep talking. Silence. Does that mean they agree or they're afraid to defend me or... They just don't want more detention. I'll never know. I'm disappointed in all of you, he says. Even if you didn't remove the chair bolts, you knew someone did. So you're just as responsible for what happened. You should have spoken up. History books are full of horrible things happening because people sit back and do and say nothing. To you, what happened today's okay because it wasn't you being bullied. But one day it could be. Remember that. I actually don't mind that, you know, atrocities happen because good people sit back and say nothing. Or, yeah, it's arguable whether they're good, but, uh, like, average people sit back and say nothing. I don't mind that, that lesson, but I think that's a bit of a jump in conclusion, assuming that everyone knew that the bolts had been removed from the chairs. Because that's not necessarily the case. The only people that knew who was the bolts were removed from the chairs were most likely just Marissa and Courtney, maybe if they told a couple of people. But to assume that everyone knew that, I think is a bit of a leap. And a bit of group punishment thinking that I don't care for. No ignoring it. My eyes zoom in on a picture frame on the math teacher's desk. There's a photo of Mr. Harrington, his wife, and their little daughter, who's not so little eating watermelon and celebrating the 4th of July. His daughter smashes her whole face into the red flesh of the fruit, juice dripping from her chin, stray seeds sticking to her chubby cheeks. So that's why he stood up for me. Mr. Harrington motions for me to join him in the hallway. Call someone to pick you up, go home, and have a good cry. When you come back on Monday, pretend like this never happened. Just ignore them. Mr. Harrington, you're a math teacher. What's the probability of that changing anything? I started to walk away, but turned back. And I hope you never tell your daughter to just have a good cry and ignore bullies. She deserves better. You're right, Ellie. Mr. Harrington calls out after me. She does deserve better. And so do you. Maybe better advice might be to spend your energy focusing on what and who makes you happy instead of focusing on fools who don't like you for whatever reason. I, I don't think his advice was terrible. Was it the most productive? No. And I also don't like, this is, this kind of happens repeatedly, where the only people that are nice to her are people that have other fat people in their lives, and everyone else is just this monstrous person that's looking to make fun of fat people. I really don't like that whole perspective. I think that's incredibly short-sighted, and it, it's creating this narrative that people just in general lack empathy and the ability to put themselves in other people's shoes. Middle school is the 
epitome of a lack of empathy with Pierce. Like, I get that because they, that hasn't fully developed yet. And it can kind of go by the wayside in an effort to blend in more with the group. It's like the, it's emotionally and cognitively when it comes to social experiences, it can be one of the uh, coldest times to experience. But, I don't know, her referencing his daughter, I just, I don't know how I feel about all of that. Brace, brace, brace. Me. Today can't get any worse. Universe. Challenge accepted. When I sit down to dinner, Liam starts in as he smears butter on an ear of corn. Splash broke a chair in math class today. Of course he knows about my humiliation. He's friends with Marissa's brother. Like a passenger on a nose-diving plane, I brace for impact. But then I decide to speak up. I do know my worth. It wasn't like that, Liam, and you know it. Were you one row of corn gone, lips smacking, or were you not second row gone, lips smacking, on the floor in math class, third row gone, lips smacking? You know I was set up, I shout. Can't we send her off to some fat camp? Or make her have surgery or something? Now Liam's talking with his mouth full, spraying corn bits across the table. I'm sure you wish I'd never been born. Well, guess what? I wish that about you. Ellie, Mom doesn't finish her sentence. Inside my head, I finish it for her. You big old fat thing. Anais looks at me with sad puppy eyes. Pity. Perfect. Stop it! Dad bangs his tea glass down on the table like a judge with a gavel calling for order in the court. His hands form, here's the church and here's the steeple. He gives me all of his attention. Sometimes I can't tell if that's a dad thing or one of his psychiatrist moves. What happened? Just like a writer, I tell the story of what Marissa and Courtney did, except I realize the story doesn't have an end. Not yet. So... Liam legit was being kind of a dick, and I think I this is interesting, and I don't I don't think kids would pick up on it, but her mom starting in Ellie not finishing her sentence, I think might have actually been a moment like Ellie equates it with her mom wanting to chime in again about her weight, which could be possible given just like the mother's cartoonishly abusive, but. There's something about not finishing her sentence. I think maybe she realizes that she allowed her son to bully her youngest daughter. And now her youngest daughter is showing the effects of that. And maybe she's taking a moment to realize that she fucked up somewhere. That's what I think. No love. Like Texas tea gushing from an oil rig, dead erupts. The school has got to put a stop to this bullying. Dinner is over, he says, and starts clearing the table. Slamming the plates as he stacks them, Mom starts gathering leftovers to take into the kitchen. Liam tries to swipe another lamb chop. Hey, I'm still eating here. Go to your room, Mom orders. Only I stay seated, but nobody pays attention to me. With the swing door propped open, from the dining room to the kitchen, I have a front row seat for all the action. It's like a tennis match, but my parents slob words as they argue, except there's no love. I'm calling the school. You're just going to make it worse, Mom says. I silently side with her on this one. There are laws, Dad scrapes the food off the plates. Not easily enforceable, Mom loads the dishwasher. Crash. Oh no, Philip, you ruined a plate. Mom sounds more upset about the broken dish than by what's happening to me. Marissa and Courtney have to be punished. Nobody deserves to be treated like this. Dad grabs the broom. As he sweeps up the pieces, Mom bends down with the dustpan and says, It'll get worse if we make a big deal about it. If she lost weight, all of this would stop. You're incredible, Miriam. You know that? And you're ignoring the effect her weight has on everything. Miriam, someone hurt our child. Don't you get that? What you don't get, Philip. I've heard enough. I get up, and they don't even notice when I leave. Well, I to see that Dad's, like, finally sticking up for his daughter, but at the same time, like, he's arguing with the mom, and I get that, and they want 
He wants justice for his daughter, and that's great. There's just something... What mom's rationale just does not make sense, and it kind of feeds into her cartoonishly abusive pattern here. And the dad... Dad's defending bit is, again, inconsistent, because while they were eating, Liam was, like, teasing his sister. And it it wasn't even, like, a, mentioning what happened, so I understand the dad's being silent when he's talking about she ended up on the floor in math class, but when he says, can't we send her off to fat camp or make her have surgery or something, dad doesn't chime in for that. So dad's defense is kind of, like, seems to be only towards those outside of the family and not about defending her from those inside the family. It's it's just a bit odd to me. Checking on me. Lap after lap, I slap, slap, slap my arms against the water and kick my legs fast and hard. Then I dive under to yell the words I wish I'd said at school and during dinner. Spent, I exhale through my nose, creating a trail of bubbles at the top, where I find Catalina sitting near the steps. Never heard you splash so hard so long. Thought maybe something was wrong. Came through the new gate to check on you. She squints. Your eyes are really red. Chlorine, I mumble. Friends shouldn't lie to friends. What's wrong? I shake my head. I just can't. I dive under, swimming and screaming until my lungs burn for air. When I surface, Catalina's still there. She's sitting on the edge closer to me. I glide over to Catalina. Thank you, I say, my voice hoarse from all that crying. I don't know what happened to you or why people are so mean, Ellie, but I do know whatever someone did is a reflection of them, not you. From I to we. The next day I go for a swim, like always, and Catalina sits on the deck, practicing her guitar, like always. I finish my laps and tread water at the side of the pool. I don't think you should stay there. She stops strumming. Do you want some privacy? I want some company. She sets down the guitar and yanks off her jeans and t-shirt. She's in her swimsuit. I've worn it under my clothes for weeks. I thought you'd never ask. We swim. We. You can pack a powerful punch in a two-letter word. Catalina and I circle, splash, dive, and surface just like the documentary I once saw showing a humpback and a dolphin, an unlikely pair, playing in the water. We're mismatched in all kinds of ways, yet we found each other in the ocean of people on the planet and became friends. Treat me better. When Anaya stands in the doorway, I know something's up. What do you want? She sits beside me on my bed to talk to tell you I'm sorry about the whole chair thing. Why do you care? Anaya scrunches up her face. What's that supposed to mean? You never defend me when Mom or Liam insults me. She hangs her head down. I should. The silence in the room's heavy, like the air when one storms past and another's on the horizon. I haven't been the best sister, Anaya admits, or even a good one for that matter. I sit silently, don't disagree. Okay, I suck as a sister, she finally blurts out, but I haven't treated you as badly as Liam has. Oh, well, then that changes everything. I'll go ahead and order your Sister of the Year award. I'll let you know when it arrives. Feel free to hold your breath until then. I point to the door. Out. I have homework to do. Anais gives me a sad smile. You're pretty funny, and I know. I'm lucky you're my sister. She puts her hand on my shoulder, and I pull away. I'm sorry. Saying you're sorry doesn't undo all you've done. You're right, you're right. All I can do is treat you better starting now, and I promise I will. So Anais actually hasn't had much to do with the story. So this is kind of, like, there's no real payoff of this. It's like so, it's like the author threw Ellie a bone or something, because Anais wasn't really doing anything for 90% of the story. Um, and as for Anais standing up for her in the face of their mother, I think is unreasonable. Like, if the mother is this abusive to Ellie, there's a chance that she's also abusive like this to Anais as well. Maybe not Liam. She might be one of those boy moms. But 
I don't know. I think that's a lot to expect from your sister who also has to deal with your mother. The brother thing, it it's more half and half. Yes, she should stick up for Ellie, but if the brother's the golden child, that runs into its own issues, and Anais may just be trying to survive herself. I could be wrong. Like, I don't know. Sisters at last. I can't help it. I want Anais to feel some of the hurt that I feel. So I let her have it. Do you even realize you haven't called me by my real name since my fifth birthday? Tears well in her eyes. Don't you dare cry, Anais. You don't have the right to cry. You're the reason everyone calls me Splash. But she can't help it. She buries her face in her hands and sobs. Maybe it's from watching Anais cry. Maybe it's from just thinking about all the years of being called Splash. But a wave of sadness hits. I surrender to the sadness. It's so heavy, dark, and cold. It takes my breath away. Anais leans in and whispers, I do care. I want to be here for you. I let her wrap her arms around me, draw close, hold me tight, tighter, while today's damned tears break free and we both can't stop sobbing. So I guess, I don't know, I had gotten the impression that Anais left the room, but I guess not... For me, this this whole scene here, we're just getting into kind of the writing thing. It One kind of comes out of nowhere. Two, Anais hasn't been a very strong character. So this isn't really a payoff for, for me in terms of Ellie's character arc. There's no real payoff that's happening here. Because Anais, from what we've seen, like, apart from the very first scene where she calls Ellie Splash, hasn't done much since then. At least not that we've seen, other than just kind of stay quiet and stay under the radar. Which, given the dysfunctional level of the family, I think kind of makes sense. I don't know. I kind of feel like Anais is probably dealing with her own shit and has been focused more on survival. And Ellie just kind of was collateral damage for that. Like, I don't know. I don't know. There's just something about this that doesn't... Narratively, it doesn't work for me. Realistically, it doesn't work for me. There's too many things that are still up in the air. I don't care for it at all. I don't think it works. Called by name. An oyster can turn something irritating into a rare and beautiful pearl. People do that too. And Ice and I end up talking for hours. It's as if we're making up for lost time. She says seeing my bruises after the prank with the chair woke her up. I just kept thinking... I can't believe they hurt Ellie. I mean, they really hurt her. I don't tell her that the bruises hurt less than the words they've said, that there are wounds she can't see. I don't say anything because I can only focus on one thing. She called me Ellie. Ignored out of existence. Surprise, surprise, Dad calling the school about the chair incident doesn't stop Marissa and Courtney from being mean to me. Now, instead of torturing me, they ignore me, and have their friends ignore me too. At first I think being ignored is better than being humiliated. But then I wonder, because when people look right through you, it's like you don't even matter, like you don't exist, and everyone is fine with that. I don't know, I personally would think that being ignored... uh, I'm a loner though, so perhaps it's different for other people, but I think being ignored is far better than being actively humiliated and bullied. But we've reached another end to this uh, end of a section, so I'm going to end it here. What do you think of this? Especially, I'm really curious what you thought of the whole interaction between Ellie and her sister. Because for me, like, the payoff wasn't there. It wasn't, it wasn't a good scene, narratively speaking. It just did not work for me in the slightest. But I want to hear your opinion in the comments down below. Thank you so much for listening. Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next time.